Lord, we come to you this morning looking for a word, looking for an answer, looking for a confirmation. Speak to us, Lord. It is you, not I. So I said I was going to sing, right? My voice is a little scratchy. I know normally I have this beautiful operatic voice, but I have to tell you about Zacchaeus. I love Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Just his name is kind of fun to say. Say it, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Well, it always makes me smile because I think of the song that I was taught when I was a little bitty child in Sunday school. I mean, a little bit, you know, with the black shoes little white lacy socks and the frilly dress and all that. They used to sing this little song. So I'm going to sing it this morning. You sing it. No, you sing long. If not, don't laugh at me. But it goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Or I'm going to your house today. Or I'm going to your house today. Now you may ask, one, why is she singing that? And two, what does that have to do with the sermon this morning? Well, I love it because some of my favorite Bible stories I learned as a child. And I learned songs to go along with them. And that's how I remembered them over the years. Anything associated with music, I can pretty much remember. But I loved to sing that little song when I was a kid because we would really get into it <clears throat> when we were singing. And the name Zacchaeus, it just makes me smile. But in the old or in the New Testament, when Jesus was telling this story about Zacchaeus, that was an ugly word. His name didn't make people smile at all. His name, his name made people frown. It's a really well-known story. It's a human story about a little short guy crawling up in a tree to see over the crowd. And probably all of us have known the birth of being too short at some point. Maybe too short in stature as we were a child or too short in our finances to see where we were going or too short in our life plan to not know how we were going to make it until tomorrow. Whatever way that we were too short, I'm sure at some point we were trying to see Jesus along the way. And that's what Scripture tells us. Scripture says he was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. Yeah, I think it's Zacchaeus and I smile. Because I can relate to being too short at certain times in my life. But as cute as the story may have been to me as a child, um, it's actually a very powerful and provocative story in Scripture. And I want to share it with you today if you're not familiar with it. And if you are, we can do a different way of thinking about it. The story of Zacchaeus introduces the very radical notion that God will stop at nothing less than total transformation of who we are. So I want us to take a look at Zacchaeus. Who was Zacchaeus? He was the chief tax collector for the Roman Empire in this particular city. He had a staff of collectors that worked for him. And more than likely, he was the most hated uh, person in his town. Because a tax collector was regarded as a traitor. He was regarded as a traitor to his own people because he and his collectors, if you will, could stop anybody for any reason and take their money. He could stop anybody in Jericho and take everything that they had in the name of the Roman Empire. So if you had a cart with a horse, he could charge you taxes on the cart even if he charged you yesterday. And he could charge you taxes on each field of the cart. And he could charge you taxes for the horse. And he could charge you taxes for everything that you had in your cart, everything that you had hanging on your body, around your neck, everything. And he would send the 
portion to Rome that Rome had dictated, but then he would keep everything else. So he was very, very, very wealthy and very, very, very despised. The system that they had set up was very ripe for abuse. So when the story tells us that he was rich, it was an indictment. Yeah, he was rich because he had profited off the backs of other people. He had accumulated his wealth at the expense of countrymen and he was regarded really as human filth. Zacchaeus, ironically his name means the pure one and righteous, had turned his name into a sneer on the lips of his fellow Jews. And the mention of his name evokes not a grin like it does for me, but a look of disgust. And the money was nice for Zacchaeus, I'm sure, but he lived as an outcast to his own people. So when he was trying to make it every day, he had a pretty lonely existence because nobody wanted to be his friend. Nobody wanted to talk to him. All they did was condemn him and put him down. But on this particular day, the word is out that this great rabbi, this teacher, this Nazarene named Jesus was coming through the town. And he's different. This Jesus comes to town with the reputation for being comfortable with those who are on the fringes of society. Those rejected by the trends of culture. Children and women. Black and white. Whoever was there, Jew and Gentile, Jesus was all right. They found in Jesus a listening ear, a warm reception. And Zacchaeus knew that he was worth seeking out. But it was easier said than done. Like I said, Zacchaeus was a little bitty fellow. So, as we would say today, he was vertically challenged. <clears throat> and I've heard some scholars say he was probably about elbow height. So, you can think he was very tiny, trying to get through thousands of people to see this one man, and he couldn't get through. So, trying to elbow his way through the crowd was difficult, because I'm sure as people saw him, because they were disgusted with him, they were punching him, you know, trying to keep him back, elbowing him, because everybody hated Zacchaeus. But his only hope was to skirt ahead of the crowd and to find a sycamore tree. Now, we don't have sycamore trees around here, but we do have a few in Texas. I equate them kind of to a mesquite tree. They're low to the ground, they have low branches, they branch out far, and they're wide branches. So you can actually sit on them. Almost kind of like the live oaks that we have down in South Carolina. Kind of think about that, you know, they just kind of branch out and climb it too easily. So that's what he was looking for. He was looking for a place that he could get above and away from the crowd. So he could see Jesus. It would give him a ringside view to what, what Jesus had to say. And so that's what he did. He waited in the tree, not knowing exactly what to expect. And then Jesus came into view. And then the most amazing thing happened. Jesus stopped and he looked up at him. And we know that Jesus had eyes that would see what others would miss. Nobody was paying attention to Zacchaeus. Nobody was looking up in the tree. Who expects the man to be up in the tree? They were looking for Jesus at eye level. But Jesus looked, looked up, and he saw Zacchaeus. Jesus was able to see into the people, and he was able to see into the situation, and he didn't miss Zacchaeus. Luke says he saw him, and he said simply, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Well, Zacchaeus wasted no time. He ran down the tree, scrambled down the tree, and he was eager to welcome Jesus. Probably had been a long time since Zacchaeus had had any visitors in his house. And for Jesus to say he was coming, he didn't ask, can I come over? He didn't ask, hey, you got time about two to have some tea? He said, I'm coming to your house. When Jesus says he's coming to your house, you better scramble and get ready. Be good if your house was in order before he says that. 
but in case it's not. When Jesus says he's coming over, get ready for a visit. So Zacchaeus was happy to welcome Jesus. Like I said, nobody ever came to Zacchaeus' house unless they were coming to complain about the taxes that Zacchaeus had stolen from them. So Zacchaeus could have stayed up in the tree and not accepted Jesus' invitation. And plenty of people do that in their own life. Jesus has given us an open invitation. And people rebuff him all the time and say, I don't need Jesus. I don't need Jesus at all. I hung around a group of people last night, actually, who told me, we don't need Jesus. We don't need God. And I told them, and they're friends of mine, but I told them, what you don't realize is Jesus is already here whether you need him or not, whether you think you need him or not. He's here, and that's why I'm here. And I'm not going away. So you can at least see a little bit of Jesus, I hope, in the fact that I'm here. And I wonder how many of us can be Jesus for folks that are stuck up in a tree that think that, just maybe, perhaps, they kind of want to check it out. But they're not sure what they're going to get into. Think about that, about the people in your life that are on the outskirts. That may be thinking about looking for Jesus, or maybe looking for Jesus and don't know where to see him. You can be that representative for Jesus and introduce him to the real. It's certainly easier to go on with our own life and to continue with our own agenda than to allow Jesus to invite himself over and let him see our lives, our real lives, what's really inside of us. Because that requires us to take a risk. And it allows uh, us to take a risk to allow Jesus into that part of us where our true self is. When you open your life up for Jesus, when you invite the Lord in, he sees every little piece. And that can be risky. But I have a word for you. <laughs> he sees it anyway. He sees it all. Allowing him in allows him to begin to change you, to conform and reform you. But Zacchaeus takes the chance and he allows Jesus into his inner room. And he was coming over for dinner, which was a rare exception in his life. And this upset the townspeople. You know, I said they began to murmur and grumble and mutter. They want to know what kind of rabbi, what kind of teacher would even acknowledge, much less go and eat with the most notorious sinner in town. And we don't know exactly what happened at Zacchaeus' house, but we see the results of what happened. And those results tell us a great deal about that interaction between Zacchaeus and his family and Jesus. Because Zacchaeus makes a pledge. He says, first, I'm going to give half of my yearly income to the poor. And then secondly, I'm going to return any stolen money that I have four times over. He didn't just say he was going to return it. He was going to get four times back the amount that he stole. Now that's important because the Jewish law at the time said that if you steal something from someone, you have to give them their property back plus 20%. Well, Zacchaeus was given back 400%. He thought that that was more appropriate after his meeting with Jesus. So something in that encounter with Jesus changed the way Zacchaeus saw the world. Zacchaeus could now see people in me where before he only saw people that he needed to steal from. You see, Jesus changes how we see, how we view other people. And no longer do labels work when you're walking with Jesus. Labels like poor and rich, Democrat and Republican, white, black, gay, straight, male, female. When you're walking with Jesus, you just see people as people, or as I like to say, folks as folks. 
those labels begin to fall away. Walking with Jesus allows you to see real people with real needs. And we get a glimpse of that when a disaster occurs. And I thought it was appropriate for this story this weekend, given Hurricane Matthew and the destruction that it has. Because when a hurricane like Matthew blows through, people rally to the support of neighbors and strangers without concern for who they are or who they were before the storm. They don't care about their social status or their skin color. They care about the fact that their house has been destroyed or they no longer have a vehicle, or they've lost a family member. Disasters like that bring people together without the need for labels. It's easy in a time of disaster to see with the eyes of Jesus. So scripture tells us that salvation comes to Zacchaeus' house, and he is forever changed from a taker to a giver. This man made his living taking from others. And suddenly, instantly, after just one encounter with Jesus, he has changed. How many of us have been changed by our encounter with Jesus? It may have been a while since your first encounter with Jesus. Do you remember what you were like before? <coughs> this meeting with Jesus. The redeemed Zacchaeus past. It transformed his present and it redirected his future. Let me say that again. The meeting with Jesus redeemed Zacchaeus' past. It transformed his present and it redirected his future. Isn't that what God wants to do with each of us? He wants to redeem our past. He wants to transform our present, and he wants to redirect our future. This is a story, a powerful story, of how the grace of God can radically change us as human beings. This change, no doubt, cost Zacchaeus his job, because he could no longer be a benefit to the Roman government, because he wasn't stealing from people anymore. And in some church traditions, Zacchaeus went from not only being a tax collector, but actually being a bishop at Caesarea. So he went from one of the most despised people to a great man of God because of the one encounter he had with Jesus. This encounter is much more than just a little nursery story for little kids in Sunday school. The story of Zacchaeus is a powerful story of change. Redemptive change. And it is found only in the Gospel of Luke. And it turns out, in a way, to kind of be a reproduction of the mission of Jesus. For Jesus was received by the outcast, condemned by the authorities. And that murmuring, well, it follows Jesus all the way to Jerusalem and even to the cross. This story of Jesus. And the story of Zacchaeus it starts with a man and ends in the tree. Jesus is coming to our town. He's already here. And he has an agenda to seek and save and to change the world. One person at a time. So I'm going to invite you this morning to picture in your mind this spiritual tree. I invite you to climb the tree and see what Jesus is about to do. He may stop beneath the tree where you sit. And no matter how comfortable, no matter how complacent or secure you may be, he may look at you and invite you down. Down to fellowship with him, to come down and to be transformed. And sometimes, even when we're saved, and we may have been saved for a while. We need a refresher course. We need Jesus to shake our world a little bit and remind us that we are indeed changed. It takes courage to get down out of the tree, 
to walk with Jesus, to invite him in to the innermost parts of who you are. And it takes courage to live that changed life. But it's worth it. In the end of Zacchaeus' story, Jesus declares that salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was lost, and he'd become confused about why he was here, and who he was, and who he was called to serve. So I ask this morning, are you confused, maybe, about why you're here? Not just here this morning, but why are you here on this earth? What is your purpose in life? And who are you supposed to serve? And who are you supposed to be serving? Because make no mistake, if you're a follower of Christ, you are called to serve someone else. That's just how it works. Jesus comes looking for us and invites us to have a changed life. A life that is continually transformed into the image of Jesus. So I invite you to come down this morning as we pray. Let us pray for God to stop by our sycamore tree, to redeem our past, transform our present, and redirect our future. Will you join me? God, God, God.